Good afternoon, radio audience, and again, as always, I want to thank you for tuning in to the Unadulterated Truth broadcast, a broadcast that's a live Bible question answer program where you, the radio listeners, you have the opportunity to afford it to you to pick up your phones dial, uh, by dialing 281-837-2222 if you have any Bible questions, comments you'd like to make, and we will give you book, chapter, verse for all of your Bible questions, and we uh, would love to listen to your comments as well. We deal with the subject this afternoon, you think you're saved, but this is why you're not. Amen. You think that you're saved, but this is why uh, you are not. And I want to pick up with Jesus' conversation with the Samaritan woman at the well, and we'll pick up, if we could, at verse, at verse number uh, 11 uh, of our Bibles, where the Bible says, the woman said unto him, talking to Jesus, sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep from whence then thou hast this living water. Are you greater than our father Jacob, which gave us this well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water, springing up into everlasting life. The woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water, that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus said unto her, Go call your husband and come here. Jesus, uh, the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, You have well said, I have no husband. For you've had five husbands, and whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that says thou truly. The woman said unto him, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Our fathers worship in this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship, you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The woman said unto him, I know that Messiah is coming, which is called Christ. When he has come, he will tell us all things. Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto you am he. I've read into your hearing uh, John chapter 4, verse 11 uh, through verse number 25, 26. And I use these scriptures to get a running start on today's lesson. You think you're saved, but this is why you're not. And Brother Javier is making his way to the mic who's going to lay the foundation uh, for today's uh, discussion. Brother Javier Frias. Amen. God bless you, Brother Thank Henry. You, brother. Very important subject uh, we were speaking about uh, this evening audience. You think you're saved, but this is why you're not. You know, in the Old Testament, it shows the story of the book, books that Moses wrote when it comes to Genesis. When it comes to Cain and Abel, <clears throat> Abel was not a Christian. He was not a Jew. However, the Scriptures talks about him in good light or good standings uh, with God, that, that his works were righteous. Noah was not a Jew. Noah was not a Christian. However, he was a believer who found favor before God's eyesight. And uh, the Bible talks about him in good standings with God. Now, there was a time frame after that where the Jews went to Egypt, where Jacob went to Egypt as well, and also the 12 tribes. And they were there around 430 years after that, what God did was he led them out uh, of Egypt into the promised land. So those 12 tribes, the Bible says that he called out of all the families of the earth, he chose them. So from that time frame, you have to be of the lineage of the tribes uh, and be faithful in that lineage uh, to be a child of God. If you were not of those tri tribes, you had to become a proselyte and follow the Jewish uh, commandments to follow the law of Moses uh, to be saved. Now, but what Brother Henry just read in John chapter 4, this woman, this Samaritan woman, she was mentioning concerning the place where she was. She said in verse 12, Jacob gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle. Right? And so what she is trying to show in verse 20 is that our fathers worship in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship. Right? So she is teaching Jesus that the fathers gave them this mountain, and 
uh, you say in Jerusalem is a place where you ought to worship. So she's trying to teach him this is where you're supposed to worship. Jesus said in verse 21, Believe me, the hour cometh, when ye shall neither in, mount, in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. At this time frame, Jerusalem is where men worship. When this was happening, this woman, she did not know what she was worshiping concerning the mountain, wrong location. Uh, wrong image, wrong way of worship. But in her heart, she was taught that that's the place. That's why she said, our fathers worship. So she was taught that that's the place where you're supposed to worship, which is a lie. It didn't come from God. It didn't come uh, from the Old Testament. So when you look at the scriptures and where it says, the hour comes and now is, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and truth, the Father seeketh such to worship him. Today, we're talking about a time frame where it's after Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Where now you have a different time frame where you have Christianity. So the word Christian is first used uh, in Antioch. Christian is mentioned three times in the scriptures. Uh, it's not mentioning Pentecostal or Baptist or any other faith. And... When you look at the apostles and the disciples, where there was a 120, and then there was 3,000 added to that number, then afterward more thousand were added. Understand when an individual like Henry, like Brother Ozan, came to you, preached unto you the gospel, that Christ died for your sins, he is seated at the right hand of God, resurrected according to the scriptures. Jeremiah 31, 31 talks about a new covenant that is going to be brought. Acts chapter 20 verse 28 says that he purchased the church with his own blood. Now the question is, which church did he purchase with his own blood? Because there are many uh, today. In the book of Acts chapter 17, the Bible mentions many gods that they had. Verse 23, Paul got at their attention. He says, for as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God, therefore ye ignorantly worship him, declare I unto you. Right? He noticed it was given to idolatry in verse 16. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given uh, to idolatry. So he was stirred up. He seen different idols, different gods. Right? Today we have different gods in the world, different ways of worship, whether it be Buddha, whether it be Muhammad, Vishnu. At the same time, here in the United States of America and beyond these seas, uh, the borders that we have, we have other gods. In Mexico, they have uh, Mary uh, that they worship and pray to, even here in the Catholic faiths in this country. Also, you have Pentecostals, Presbyterians. You have many different forms or many different Christs. Now, I want to show what he was teaching them. Verse 32 says, And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked and others said, We will hear thee again of this matter. So some are going to mock when we say that there's one body, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one church in the Bible. They make fun of the one baptism we talk about. If they say we've been baptized already in Jehovah's Witness, Pentecostal, they, they mock at our baptism or they mock that there's one church and they say, you guys think you're the only ones going to heaven. Or you go on Google and, and look up, well, I looked up the Church of Christ, and I found out that you guys are a cult. Or you go on Google again and say, well, your church started by Alexander Campbell. So the idea is that in their mindset, they say, well, the Internet doesn't lie. But indeed, the Internet does lie. The scriptures re represent truth, and Google has a mixture of truth and lies. So if you don't follow the pattern of the scriptures, you're going to get lost in the world of Google and follow a lie and deception. Remember the Jews when uh, Jesus resurrected from the dead. What did they say? Go and tell them that they stole his body. And this was commonly reported among the Jews today, meaning that the worldwide news amongst the Jews and Gentiles that they broadcasted from Jerusalem was that they stole his body, that he didn't resurrect from the dead. Somebody took his body out, and that's it. So by 
publishing that news, fake news I call it, they tried to uh, hide the fact that he resurrected and they thought just by sending that news abroad, everything was going to be okay. The Jews were going to continue their power, their works in the temple with the priests, with the Levites, with the sacrifices, with the holy days, with the Sabbaths. They believed that their power was going to continue and that God was not going to execute what he promised through the prophets. Prophet Isaiah, where Moses said, I will uh, bring up a man, a prophet like unto myself. Whoever doesn't listen to him will perish, will die. Jeremiah talked about a new covenant. Isaiah talked about in Isaiah 53 how he was going to die, how he was going to be grieved when he was on earth. The Bible talks about him. It talks about his covenant. Isaiah chapter 2, Daniel chapter 2 talks about the church, how it was going to come into place. So audience, understand that the prophecy of what Christ was going to bring after his death, it is coming to pass. It has come to pass already, and we're speaking about it this day, this very day. From th those same 120 souls to those 12 apostles, this is how salvation is brought. They spoke to another person face to face. They heard the gospel. They got baptized and received the Holy Ghost. They were taught on the foundation of Christ and built up. That person spoke to someone else. That is how salvation from the day of Pentecost until today is done. Jesus, when he knocked Paul off the horse, he spoke to him. He told him, go to the city. It's going to be told unto you what you have to do. And I said, arise and be baptized. Wash away your sins. Call on the name of the Lord. So he got baptized for the remission of sins. That's how he got added to the body. That same way of salvation is here today. So that means after 2,000 years, all these new ways of being saved are not accepted by Jesus Christ. They're not accepted by Jesus Christ. And so you may ask the question, who are you that you should judge me? Who am I that I should judge you? So we ask questions and we ask for Bible answers. And so when it comes to the truth, this word cannot be broken. The scriptures can't be broken. So when it comes to proving all things, Christ, according to James chapter 1, he gives the answers to those who do his will. The Bible says, if you do his will, you will keep, you will know his doctrine, Amen. in other words. So when it comes to the discussions that we've had over the years on this broadcast, or even in person, not just us, but saints of God all over the world, the consistent uh, approving of what God has said and disapproving of man-made teaching from these man-made religions is what gives us authority with Christ to show you the truth. Our goal and our attempt is not to ridicule you or embarrass you just for the fun of it or just uh, because we have the power to do so. That's not why Christ gave us the knowledge of truth and the spirit of truth. It is to guide you away from the power of darkness into the power or the kingdom of God's dear son. That's what we were in. All three of us were lost in man-made religions as well. We were in the same position some of you were in. And Christ showed us the light through the gospel and through showing of his kingdom, which is his church, so we could be saved ourselves, so we can stand in the clear. Uh, be not prideful. Be not arrogant. Be not led astray by the example of your friends, relatives, or your favorite minister, pastor, reverend, or doctor on a television screen, because that will guide you to the devil's hell. All we ask is that you prove all things that we're saying. And if we're wrong, we'll repent. We have no problem with that. But the idea is that if we are right, we ask that you be sincere. We ask that you open up the scriptures, open your heart to what we're saying. Because if what we're saying cannot be disapproved or uh, be seen as not legitimate, then you have a right to continue your walk in the faith that you're in. But if we're, what we're saying is right, and if we're answering every question, we ask that we op you open your heart so you be not led astray. The number to call is 281-722-22. Thank you, Javier Frias. And radio listeners, I pray that you are listening with honest hearts to what Brother 
Javier was saying uh, to you and I. You know, I heard brother, uh, I heard rather, uh, brother Ozan, brother Javier. I heard uh, John Hayden just the other day, and uh, on his television program mentioned that baptism does not save. And see, Saints and radio listeners, this broadcast, as mentioned, is not to uh, to try to belittle anybody, but we're begging you to be like the saints in Acts 17, 11, in Berea, the Jews who search the scriptures to find out if what we're saying is so. You know, the Old Testament is for our learning. And I'm going to go back to 2 Kings 5, 8. I do want to hear from Brother Jose today. 2 Kings 5, 8. Uh, I want you to listen here at an individual who thought that he knew how God should save him and got angry about it, as many of you do. And this is Naaman the leper. 2 Kings 5, 8. The Bible said, it was so when Elisha, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore have you rent your clothes? Let him come now to me, this is what Elisha tells the king, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot. He stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a message unto him, saying, Now notice, Elisha don't go himself. He sent a message and said, I need you to go wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall come again to you, and you shall be clean. So what did Elisha do? He's a prophet of God, but he doesn't go himself. He sends a messenger to, uh, to Naaman. Now look at Naaman's response in verse 11. But Naaman was wroth. And he went away and he said, Behold, like many of you, I thought. Mm. doesn't matter what you think. Amen. Behold, I thought. He will surely come out to me. He'll stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, strike his hand over the place, and recover the leper. You see how upset he is? He's upset because he had a plan of how God should save him. And then he goes on to say, Are not Abana and Farpar rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Now not only is he mad how God is going to do it, he's mad at the place that God had given him in order for it to happen. That may I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned, and he went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, now if the prophet had bid you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much rather then would he say unto you, Wash and be clean? Then went he down, and he dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying, get this, of the man of God, and his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Do you all see that? In order for him to be saved, in order for you to not to be saved, it's not based upon what we think or what we believe or what somebody else taught us. It's based upon what did the apostles teach in the word of God. I am afraid that many of you who are sitting in these denominational buildings, under these denominational preachers, what we're asking you to do is to wake up like we had to. Wake up from people telling you that baptism is just an outward sign for an inward grace. My friend, you are not saved. You do not have the Spirit of God because the Bible don't teach that that's how one received the Spirit of God today. There is no Baptist church in the Bible. There is no Methodist church in the Bible. Presbyterian church in the Bible. Please search the Scriptures and come out of false doctrine. John Hagee said it doesn't save. I'm going to show you one scripture, and Brother Ozan's going to take it from here. And you have to ask yourself a question. Do you believe what the scripture says? Not what mama taught, not how you were raised, but do you believe the scriptures? Amen. John Hagee says baptism does not save. Joel Osteen believed it doesn't save. Greg Griffin believed that it doesn't save. Listen what Peter says about it in the New Testament. The like figure, he uses an Old Testament example of Noah and the ark. The like figure, whereunto, listen to me, even baptism does also now save us. Amen. It's not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Do you see that? When a person gets in the water of baptism, they are calling at that point on God to save them. And where does he answer? In baptism. It's not a sinner's prayer. It's not a asking Jesus to come into your heart. Christians don't get baptized. Sinners get baptized to become Christian. Please search the scripture, 281-837-2222. Brother Ozan. Thank you, Henry. Javier, God bless you both. Man, this is really an awesome day. Audience, I will heal my voice at the time. At some point, you're going to have to set aside prior teaching and understand that the Lord is trying to reach you with the truth. 
you're not going to be able to turn towards the things that you thought would be of salvation. I want to share something with you quickly. I'll flip it back to our brother. I want you to look at uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. I want to show you as Brother Free has laid a foundation and Henry has built thereupon to show you it isn't about you thinking you're saved yeah. or thinking of the method that should be done. It is about you reading the method with a guide showing you the way that you're to navigate through the Word of God. Okay, let's look at Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1. Now, look what Peter talks about in this writing concerning salvation, helping us to understand how we achieve it. 1 Peter chapter 1, he says clearly, verse 13, Wherefore, gird up the lawns of your mind. Notice that the lawns of your mind be sober. You've got to pull up, like a man pulls up his loins to run a race or to get in battle. Then he's got to be sober also and hope to the end for what? The grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, so you're waiting for Christ's return, but you have to understand something. You have to be sober and your loins gird about. As obedient children, not fashion yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance. What are the former lusts? Some of us come from organizations where, I, like I came from the priest, where we taught the Holy Ghost what a sin this was. It's in a little white porcelain uh, building, little small childlike toy building that's in every Catholic church. We taught that. We taught the water was holy, and that you did not enter the building by putting it on your head, making you holy, which was all error. And taught by men who designed the error, and we following as ignorant men, believing the error, he says, that's my former lust in ignorance. Verse 15. But as he which had called you is holy, so be you holy in all manner of conversation. So I have to change my manners, my life. But I couldn't do it on my own. Verse 16. Because it's written, be you holy, for I am holy. Do you know that Job explains to us that you don't have the power to make something unclean clean? Tibetan priests are no more holier than any other false religion on the earth. Although they speak of these things because they have no sanctification power. Verse 17. And if you call on the Father who without respect of persons judge it according to every man's works. He doesn't care if you're a baptized Tibetan ex-priest, a baptized Worshipper of the Bufferment. He doesn't care if you a baptized now worshiper who used to worship uh, according to Muhammad's teaching. He just wants to know, okay, what will you do now? He says, according to your work, pass the time of your surgeon here in fear. Verse 18, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold. Watch this. From your vain conversation received by traditions from your father. You know he's also talking to Jews too. The, the silver and gold cups of the tabernacle moving to the temple mean nothing. They have no meaning anymore. So this is a tradition of the father. But with the precious blood, and that's not his red blood, that's his spirit of Christ as a lamb, as a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in the last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. Now, I want to share something with you quickly. When you have come from one belief system to the truth, you have to understand what you actually left behind. Now look at Acts chapter 16. I want to show something. You've got to understand, man has a belief system about something. And he's sophisticated. And he's financially well off. Greater than many saints, but he's wrong spiritually. Acts chapter 16 and verse number 16. And it came to pass, we went to prayer. A certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. 
She wasn't preaching against Paul. She was just telling you about your life. May show you your cousin or something that died. She said, tell you his name was Bobby, wore a blue shirt. Yeah, that's him. She can't do it between the two worlds of the dead and the living. She's not can't, she's trying to make money. And the demon in her is with her. Verse 17. The same father Paul and us cried, saying, Now look at her statement. These be men and the servants of the Most High God, which show us the way of salvation. That demon does not want to lose his home. She doesn't want to lose again. They are in agreement. So they are speaking well of Paul. Why does this bother him? Here's why. And this she did many days, but Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. And when her master saw that the hope of their gain was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace of the rulers and brought them into the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, notice that, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs. Watch this, which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe being Roman. This is the system of the Roman government. It's not lawful for us to accept it or observe, which means to let this exist. Don't let this exist. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates ran out their clothes and commanded to beat them. Why? Because our customs do not allow us to go beyond tradition of our father, which say it is okay for us to have divination familiar spirits that peep and mutter. That's our thing. We worship gods that are made of made of drinking wine binges. We have a god named Zeus. You know, we've uh, taken on other gods. This is our law. And that word law for the deals with what is allowed for them to do. So you have to rid yourself of that as the brothers have taught. You have to let go. When you look at Acts 19, you're going to find out quickly as I read this one a couple of verses then we'll stop here. Acts 19, you have to find out here's a real tough story. A very tough story. And we may talk about this more next week if possible. But here is a case where you have men who have a tradition coming from Ephesus. They have to be influenced by Diana. They would be the most odd guys there. Then they shift from the worship of Diana to of all things a baptism of John, which is still wrong. And then they must retreat and now turn on to Christ. And this is the thing that you have to understand that you must battle against. This is the thing that you must understand. You cannot go on your feelings of what you already knew. You must go on the truth of the Bible. So we want to leave the faithful saints of God. In Romans 16, 16, the churches of Christ salute you. This baptism of John, I'm going to read this because you got a lot of... We got a lot of brothers don't study me. I don't know what they read. But Mark chapter 1, every time I say this, a brother look at me like I've lied. Mark 1 and 4 says, John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for remission of sins. He said remission of sins is not going to be removed because they don't understand it. And there went out to them all the land of Judea and they of Jerusalem. And were all baptized of him in the river Jordan, confessing their sin. Now, that statement, remission of sins, is the same equivalent when the atonement is given through Moses. They don't understand what atonement means. It means to forgive. They act like the word forgiveness is not in the Old Testament because Jesus has yet to come. You had to die and be forgiven on the Mosul. Am I right, brothers? Amen. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. And Amen. then God Amen. forbade those sins and put them on Christ. Just like today when we get baptized, we are baptized, but those sins have to be removed from us, and Christ has already died. But it's just verses have not or have already distilled the action. Water doesn't remove sin. Just like the scripture said, the blood of bulls and goats cannot remove sin. Well, the, the wetness of water cannot remove <laughs> sin. <laughs> now, look what Peter said. They think that because, man, the water is not hard. It's not yeah, like the Catholic amen. Church with holy water amen. or like Peter Popoff, you know, with his <laughs> fake holy water. It's not amen. nothing like that. We're teaching the truth about the Lord Jesus Christ. First Peter chapter 3 and verse number 21. The like figure lines are eating baptism. Don't also now save us, not the putting away of the field of the flesh. Amen. So it's not the water. But the answer of a good concept to our God, that's the same thing that, that Moses about to do. It, did you acknowledge the law was right? 
If you died with two witnesses saying you didn't, I mean, that's bad enough for the law to condemn you at the judgment of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is going to heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels, thorns, and powers being made subject unto him. People are teaching ridiculous thoughts that like water washed away sin. That's why they have to get baptized again. Because water isn't the actuator. It is to go in the water and the Holy Spirit takes the Spirit and cleanses it. And Jesus works in him. And that's why he says he used the Spirit to cleanse us of our sins. They still have to be put away from you. And Christ is the only one that could have received them. It doesn't matter if it's before or after. That's why he says in Romans 3, the propitiation for, sin, for sins forbear by the Lord. And you know, our brethren, I don't I'm just, I just want to encourage you, brothers. I don't know what y'all read. I just want to look at the camera. I love you. But brothers, y'all are going to have to study your Bible. You need to quit reading all those different books. And you go to school too much. Go to the school, Zion. Please study your Bible. It's a sin that you don't understand. Mark 1, 4, 5. That is a tragedy. Romans chapter 3 and verse 24. Being justified freely by his grace. And this is a problem that Orpheus Haywood can't understand. He needs remedial training and parts of justification. That's how you're saved. You're called right by God. So if you're doing something like using instruments that he knows challenges your justification, he's supposed to be preaching it is a sin now. Amen. Just like homosexuality Amen. challenges the saint's justification. Because his lifestyle is wrong. He says justified freely by his grace. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. You cannot be redeemed outside of Christ. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. That is the mercy seat. Oh, y'all just look it up. Through faith in his blood. To declare his righteousness. For the remission of sins that are past. That's the key word. Through the forbearance of God. Whenever when any one of us gets baptized. Brothers, all our sins past. They're not getting baptized for future sins, are you? No, sir. They need to be saved. You all want saved, always saved. So it's always sin that you've already committed Amen. that have been placed on Christ, and they can't understand it because Christ became sin. That means he absorbs all the sins of all men, whether they have been made or have died, and they cannot understand how it does. So what is too hard for God to do? See, now, then they're my, how, how can he grab sin that I may commit? Yeah, see, that's because, that's why one reason why you won't go to Amen. heaven, because you're challenging God on what he can do. Yeah, that's nothing that God. With man is impossible, with yes. God is possible. That's what, yeah. that's what Jesus said, didn't he? That's what he said. With yeah. you all, with man, it's impossible, because this is a miracle to be able to grab all the sins, put them on Christ, and he becomes sin and then he's Amen. strong. So now, if you don't get baptized, your sins stay with you. That's why we know Jesus did not die. For the little role, he died for those who he will redeem. Because if he dies for the world, then everyone's saved. Right. That's ridiculous. And that's what they don't understand. He doesn't even pray for the world. No. John 17, 9. He doesn't pray. I want to read this because I, uh, me and a brother was talking about this. That's a lot of you don't believe that Jesus don't pray for the world. I'm going to read the text. Now, we're going to see what's going to happen. We're going to see who's the believer after we read this. I want to see somebody tell Jesus, no, you don't. You do pray for the world and still make it to heaven. I pray for them, John 17, 9. I pray not for the world, there's the text, mm. but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. Amen. Amen. I said that. The other group is the ones who will believe based on their word. Right. So now that bounces out the world. So it's only the, un the only the believer that he, he has given his life for. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you what, that's got to be a payment in hell for that. Because there's no way you're going to sit up here and tell Jesus he praying for the world. He just told you, I don't pray for him. <laughs> That's ridiculous, man. You know, but see, this is the problem. This is tradition of the Father. This is not tradition of the Father to lie on the gospel. Mm. They lie on the gospel and name all manner of foolishness, which is not in the scripture. And then somehow it's going to be better in, in, in heaven, but you're not going to make it there. This is a good subject, Brother Amen. Freeman. God bless you, man. This is an excellent Amen. subject, my brother. Amen. That's the and and what did Jesus say? If I had not shown them their sins, they would not have sinned. See, you have your sin. God knows it's your sin. You got to be told you got the sin, and then now you have the sin, and you got to do something about. It. If Christ doesn't do that, if we don't do that, 
then they can't be held accountable to judgment. But God's not going to let them make it to the judgment like that. He's going to make sure they know it because you and I cannot stop telling them about their sin. That's why we point out homosexuality, adulterers, fornicators. We point out child molesters, people who rape, those who follow themselves. Then we point out crimes of finance, unrighteous balances, uh, governments that don't take care of their people and don't supply what their people need, don't look out for widows and the fatherless. Those are sins that when you get to the judgment, you as a world leader or a local leader, you're going to give an account to the law for it. That's why Jesus said, if I had not did the miracles, they would not know they had sin because it draws the attention that this guy is able to condemn him. And that's why they thought they could kill him and get rid of the problem, but he rose from the dead. So thank God for that because that kills that line. So that's where we at, brothers. Good, good class. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus.